Hello there, welcome back to In the Shadows of Utopia, Lachlan Peters here, and today I have another special bonus episode for you, an interview with Matt Madden. Matt has recently released the first English translation of a Khmer Rouge survival memoir, Chan Sam Un's Prisoners of Class. We had a great chat, discussed his own interesting relationship with Cambodia and the Khmer language, his journey in finding and translating the book, as well as, well, you know, in lieu of having the author himself on the show to talk to, I feel like we approached this as a kind of uh, book club. So Matt was able to share some insights into the text, and we discussed different themes and other fascinating parts of the book. Now, what I want to say about the book here in the intro is that, well, I believe it's one of the best examples of this kind of body of literature, if we want to put it that way, that these survivor memoirs exist in. The author, Chan Sam Un, was 24 years old, unmarried, living in a poor family in Phnom Penh with his parents and siblings when the Khmer Rouge took over. The forced migration into an unknown fate in the countryside, which is very well detailed in the book, is followed by, well, hardships beyond imagination, along with grief, suffering, terror, yearning, but also love, reflections on life, and what it meant to live in democratic Kampuchea. It is a moving and readable story and a great addition to these testimonies of survival under the Khmer Rouge. What sets this particular memoir apart from most, if not all, of the rest of those memoirs, however, is how soon it was written after the Khmer Rouge regime fell, and in the circumstances that it was written in. Now, we do get into this a fair bit in the discussion, so I will leave that sort of uh, preamble there. However, I will take one more moment to make a bit of an appeal to you. Firstly, I wholeheartedly recommend this book. Matt has brought this amazing story to a whole new audience with his translation, and he has contributed to it in other meaningful ways as well. So please check the episode notes for links to go and purchase the book. It's in all of the convenient places like Amazon and Kindle, but if you are in Cambodia and you can't access those sites, it's going to be stocked at Monument Books as well. Further to that, we live in a world where the unseen algorithms that dictate what you see and where, well, they reign from their shadowy, unknowable digital realms. So I'm making an appeal to those that buy the book or get the Kindle version to write a review for it, wherever you get it. Get the word out there, quite literally. Get the words, type them, and put them out there onto the internet. Because these are the things that these algorithms feed on. And this is an important book. It deserves to be right up there when someone Googles Khmer Rouge survivor story, or something similar, or even, you know, definitely when they type something like that into an online bookstore like Amazon. So please, go and get the book, and double please leave a review. Now, I myself may need to be making a similar appeal to you one day, so I do hope that you, my dear listener, will be warmed up to do that too. Okay, enough of that. Here is my discussion with the translator of Prisoners of Class, Matt Madden. I'm here with Matt Madden. How's it going, Matt? Good. How are you doing? Yeah, really good. I'm really glad you're here, mate, because, well, you've been, uh, I would say, instrumental in, in bringing a, a, a survivor of the Khmer Rouge uh, memoir to, to a new audience, an, an English-speaking audience like myself. Um, so you're the translator of Chan Samuen's 
uh, memoir, Prisoners of Class. And uh, it's recently been released. Uh, I think it's a really important, brilliant addition to that uh, literature, the, the sort of survivor literature. So I'm really excited to have you here so we can, I don't know, I, I kind of want to frame this as like a, almost like a book club um, about the book because you, you were so sort of close to, to, to this book in many ways, but not the author. Sure. Um, so I was wondering if you just want to kick us off with, I, I guess, a, a brief introduction, um, perhaps even how your... How should I put it? Like your relationship with with Cambodia came about, and sort of how you got how you got here. Sure. Uh, first of all, really happy to be here. Love the podcast. Um, I my name, as as you said, is Matt Madden. The name on, on the book is Matthew Madden. That's my real name, Matthew Madden. But a lot of people call me Matt, and that's fine. And I, I tend to call myself Matt as well. Um, I have been involved with Cambodia for. Uh, well over half of my life, most of my life, I feel like at this point, um, I first came in contact with Cambodia as a young man, in, right out, out of high school. Um, I After high school, I moved to Cambodia and just had a complete, total like immersion experience for a couple of years um, before returning to the United States and going to college. Um, and during that time, um, the immersion that I, that I mentioned was a very linguistic immersion. I was I was thoroughly immersed in the language, and I picked it up very well. I became quite fluent by the time I left two years later. And then when I was in college back in the United States, I still continued to um, visit Cambodia every year. Like when I ever had breaks or whatever, I would return to Cambodia. And then in uh, w- while I was still in college, on one of those returns to Cambodia, I, I met a girl. So this is um, my who ended up being my first wife, and you know she was raised in Phnom Penh and um, the Khmer was the language that we spoke with each other. After I, I finished college, again, I returned to Cambodia and then brought her back to the United States. And Khmer was the language of our household during our marriage. But I also, um, starting even when I was in college, began working as a translator. Um, I, would tra- I started a, my own private like freelance translation business. I would translate documents on the side. I translate a lot of, do- a lot of documents for like Um, local governments in the United States, like California has a lot of Cambodian immigrants and so forth. I also became, after college, I became a a, a court interpreter. And that's for the United States courts, where I I would interpret between English and Khmer for the courts. Um, Yeah, that's how it all started. Um, Later on in my life, I got a job working for the International Committee of the Red Cross in Cambodia, in Phnom Penh. Um, And they have... Uh, they're doing work there that involves um, what's called the detention program, which means prisons. Um, and I, I started working there full time as an interpreter um, working in this detention program, which meant that I spent a lot of time visiting prisons, speaking with, inter- uh, with uh, prisoners, interpreting for prisoners between them and other Red Cross officials. Um, the, the, the main purpose being to inter- interview them and ascertain the conditions of detention with the goal of helping the authorities improve the conditions of detention. So we also cooperated with prison directors. We also had national level programs where uh, we were trying to reduce overcrowding in the system. So we were meeting with very high level officials in Phnom Penh to talk about the criminal justice system and what, why overcrowding was a problem and how to fix overcrowding. So I met a lot of like very high level um, Cambodian officials at that time, including the prime minister and deputy prime minister and other people. During that time, the Red Cross was also also had some stewardship that, over the detention centers of the UN tribunal that was trying the Khmer Rouge. As part of that, um, I had opportunities to actually meet and speak with the people who were on trial, the defendants at the time, which was Kyo Sampan, Nguyen Chia, um, Duch, who was actually convicted already at the time. He was not a defendant. He was already convicted. But I met him. I met him more than any of the others. I met uh, Kyo Sampan probably for about... Uh, one-on-one, him and he and I for about 10 minutes. Same with Nguyen Gia, about 10 minutes. But but Dooch, I met him probably four times and had protracted conversations with him over a couple of years. So that was um, that, that was an experience with the Khmer Rouge leadership that I never expected to have in my life, but that sort of just fell into my lap. Um, so yeah, that's sort of the summation of my experience with Cambodia. I left I left employment with the International of the Khmer Rouge... In, I can't I said that. <laughs> International Committee of the Red Cross... And um, 
uh, about 10 years ago, and I actually switched careers. So now I'm a software developer in the United States, but I'm still very much involved in um, translation, especially literary translation, as we will talk about today. Of course, yeah. And and I, it would, it, it's sort of, I, I can't hear some of those things and not just, I guess, ask some, some vague questions. I know that uh, you can't be uh, too open about um, some of those conversations that you had with, you know, Khmer Rouge leaders here. But I, I wonder if, if you could speak just briefly before we get into the book, just in, I don't know, just briefly or, or however long you want to take on this, what is it like being in the same room as someone who, I mean, in the case of Doik, um, who was more or less, you know, one step away from around let's just say more than 10,000 murders. Sure. Well, that's, that's hard to um, really describe it, it. One word I might use for that is underwhelming. It's like, you imagine that this is like, it's not like, Oh, I've just felt the feeling of entering the presence of unbounded evil or anything like that. You don't feel anything like that. You just see a little old man. There's a little old man sitting there and he seems like, you know, um, the countless other little old Cambodian men that I'd met in my life. And it's, it's actually hard to actually connect that in your brain in that moment with this little old man that I'm talking to is someone famous and he's famous for doing horrible things. You can't even hardly wrap your head around it in the moment. And so that, that, was, that was my experience of it is um, trying to find in my mind some significance in the moment and kind of failing, honestly. It's just, um, yeah, it's, it's, just, it's just so banal when you actually meet a person face to face. Yeah. All right, well, let's um, move slightly away from those sort of experiences there and and move more toward, yeah, the, um, this book, this, this fantastic book, Prisoners of Class. So sure. you, you spoke a little bit about your your time in Cambodia and how, how you sort of developed this expertise to, to tackle a project like this, but I'm wondering if you wanted to just go into... Uh, um, how, how you actually came to translate this book into English for the first time. So going back to this, this is when I was still in college, actually. So when I was still in college and I, and I was on, you know, I was visiting Cambodia. It might've been when I was dating my, my future wife. It's either 2001 or 2002. I was in um, one of the markets in Phnom Penh, Dultumpung market, which the, you know, the expats have called the Russian market for of forever. For, for unknown reasons. Well, I'm sure someone knows. I don't know why that's called the Russian market, but that's what it's called. Um, but anyway, there, there are booksellers there, book stalls that sell Khmer books. And I was just browsing and I came across this little flimsy paperback book. Um, I actually have it here. I know that your audience can't see this, but if you go to MekongRiverPress.com, which is the publisher's website, there actually are a lot of color photographs, including photographs of this book, so if you want to see. But it's basically just a little flimsy paperback uh, book with a flimsy paper cover and, and no pictures on the cover just a black cover and white words and it was actually entitled um, 1366 days in hell that was the original title and so and I had never seen this before and I picked it up with great interest and started looking at it and then bought it I think I bought the first two parts so he he um, the, the author published this serially in parts and not all at once so he first he published part one and then part two, and in total there were five parts um, that he published starting in 1999 through to 2000. 2000. And um, I was very interested in this book because I, I had read a number of um, what I call Khmer Rouge survivor memoirs, including um, memoirs by like um, T. Dabut Mom, who wrote To Destroy Is No Loss. I had, I had recently read um, Ung Loon's book, uh, First They Killed My Father and Jan Ratihim, uh, when Broken Glass Floats, I think if I remember correctly that those two books had just recently come out at the time. Um, and so and I had so I had read these books that all had a lot of things in common with each other. And here was something that was quite different in a special way, I thought. So uh, to encapsulate this, I would say there's kind of a, I don't know, maybe a formula that, that is followed in these books. And this is not to disparage them. I don't, I'm not saying they're formulaic, but the, the, the patterns of experiences were very similar in a lot of these books. It usually involved... A young person, sometimes not young, sometimes older, like, um, you know, Benyatai was older. He was a full adult. But a lot of these people were young children or adolescents. Um, they live in the city. Um, they 
they they witness the Khmer Rouge take over, and suddenly their lives are turned upside down. And when they have to migrate out into the countryside, and they experience these horrible um, things such as executions and death and starvation and illness and so on, that pattern is pretty common throughout all of them. Um, but all of them, every every one, every single book I'd ever read about this uh, always ends with a refugee story. It's some somebody they run across, they have to get across the border to Thailand. They go to refugee camps, and then eventually they end up in America or sometimes France. Um, but every single one of them, the last 25% to a third of the story is a refugee story. And 10 or 20 years later, they, they have, you know, they've learned this foreign language. They've um, adapted to this foreign country. And now they're ready to write their story, looking back on their youth or, or, you know, 10, 20 years ago in that foreign language for a foreign audience. So all of them are for a foreign audience. All of them are written by refugees. Um, but this book, this is the first one I'd ever seen that was written entirely in Khmer. And it was written by a man who never left. So after after it ended, um, he just stayed in Cambodia and, you know, picked up the pieces of his life and then wrote about it. And a- another thing that was unusual about this story, now parts parts of it, by the way, I would say are do fit the formula because he did start out in Phnom Penh. So he experienced that, that whole thing of the expulsion and the, his life turning upside down. But the whole book goes all the way through to the end without any refugee story. And he wrote it very, very early. He writes in the preface, of, uh, which was the first thing I read. I read. I read this preface where he said, I wrote this book starting in October 1979 and ending in April 1980, which is extremely early. That's right after the end of the Khmer Rouge um, and entirely in Khmer. So those factors together give it this sort of different voice and different perspective. His audience is not... You and me, Lachlan, it's, it's not um, Australians or Americans or French people. It's just other Cambodians. In fact, I wouldn't even say that. It reads to me like his audience was just himself. Um, you have said, I've heard you say that it reads like a diary. And in many ways, it does read like a diary. And in fact, he sort of sat on this manuscript for 20 years unpublished. So I don't think, I don't think another soul read this book for 20 years um, besides himself. So it was a very personal thing. So all of those factors combined made me feel like this is a this is like a special thing. This is a unique thing, and I felt like other people, people who care about Cambodian history, would want to know about this, and they would like to read it. And so I kind of took it on as an ambition of my own that someday I would like to see this book translated and published in English. Now, at the time, I was young. I had spoken the language for how long? Maybe four years, five years at that point. I felt like I was unqualified. I actually didn't have much doubts that I could do it, but I felt like I would I would seem unqualified. People, the world would not take me seriously as the person who should be doing this. But I but I very much kept it on a sort of a back burner in my life. And as I went through life and went through other things, jobs and etc., et I would frequently take it out and work on it. I would translate chapters over the years. Um, but then I had more experiences. You know, as I recounted earlier, I became a court interpreter. I interpreted in courts. I worked. Then I worked in Cambodia. I interpreted in prisons and I interpreted for high officials and. Um, said, before you know it, you blink your eyes and 20 years has gone by. So in 2022, I was thinking about this and I reached a conclusion that this is the year I'm going to do it. I'm going to make this thing happen. I'm not going to live my life and have this ambitious, this great thing that I want to happen, just not happen. Part of the problem was I had never met the author. I didn't even know if the author was still alive. And for various reasons, one of which is legal, I had to have his permission um, to translate the book. And if he wasn't alive, I'd have to get his, you know, estate's permission or whatever. And I was afraid I had waited too long. You know, I realized he must be an old man by now if he's still alive. And I could not put it off any longer. So in my personal life, I had this sort of, um, I had uh, the, the company I've worked for gives you a, a sabbatical after five years of service. And I had that coming up and I thought, I'm going to use this sabbatical and I'm going to make this the focus of 2022, including my sabbatical. And I did. So the first thing I did was I tried to find the author. Um, I tried reaching out to old emails that he that he had listed in old editions of the book to no avail. Eventually, I reached out to the Khmer Writers Association, which I knew he was a member of because he had put that on the cover of his of the second edition, the second Khmer edition. And um, they responded to me and said, "Yes, he is still alive, and yes, he's a he's an old man. He's not good with technology, but we will help you communicate with him." And so I sent them a letter, which they forwarded to him, and then he wrote a letter and forwarded it back to me. Um, in I excerpt some parts of those, both of those letters in the, in the foreword of Prisoners of Class, 
where basically I've just told him how I feel about the book, um, how much I admire it, and how I really would like to translate and publish it in English. And he, he responded very enthusiastically and said that it's been a dream of his for, um, you know, 20 years to have this book published in English because he would like other people to know about his experiences. Uh, and so he was very happy to have me do this. So we, we, we appointed with one another to meet up in Phnom Penh um, later in the year. So um, I met the author. Um, I be became friends with him. And maybe we can talk a little bit more about those travels at some point um, later in the, in the conversation. Um, but that having him on board then was the was really important. Um, it was a great. It, I was really happy that he was able to put his stamp on this process and on the final thing. I was able to ask him many questions about the text itself, many questions that I'd had during the translation in person, and sometimes at the very place where the events happened. So that was great. Oh, it's fascinating that you were able to. A, that you kind of both had this dream separate for 20 years and you're both able to sort of realize it in that way. That's that's really special. And also, I don't know, it strikes me as a... Maybe it's just because we both have this interest in Cambodia, but it strikes me as this very kind of... Uh, the kind of experience that you have in that country. Like, it's 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 really amazing, quite serendipitous. I, I really enjoyed hearing that, man. Um, but I feel like... Like that in and of itself is fascinating. And like you said, we will talk a bit more about that relationship that you developed um, with him at, toward toward the, the end of this discussion. But I feel like it's time that we should sort of get into the book a little bit itself. Um, you mentioned some of the quite unique facets of the text. Um, and I certainly, I, I, I would echo, I would echo that completely. Um, uh, for just for the audience, like Matt, Matt did get in contact with me. Um, it would have been in the latter half of 2022, I think. And um, so I, I was sent a couple of chapters as as he was still working on them. So that's right. My experience was reading it in a bit of a stop start way, but it was only um, I went on holiday recently and I brought with me a, a full copy of the book, which has now been released. And on my second read through, um, yeah, these things really did just start to stand out to me a lot more. Um, as Matt says, it sort of this. Can I say a word about um, the reason why I reached out to you, Lachlan, first off? At, at around the same time that I was um, ramping up my project to finish this book in 2022 is, is around the same time that I discovered In the Shadows of Utopia podcast. And I was listening to it a lot. And I was listening to it on my, my journeys to Cambodia and so forth. And I felt that, that this podcast is a great synthesis of sort of all of the very, the disparate sources about this history and that's sort of tying them together into this nice narrative that's it's um, consumable. Um, I, and I thought it was great. And I had this fear that this podcast was going to reach the period covered by this book, 1975 to 1979, without you even knowing about this resource, which I thought was an important resource. I thought that it was a great historical document to document this historical event. And I, and for, if there's a person out there who's collecting all these sources and synthesizing them, I want that, that person to have access to this. So that's why I reached out to you, Lachlan, um, early for fear that you would get there before I did. And just to make sure that you had this resource. And so I sent to you, um, uh, you know, early drafts of the manuscript just to make sure that was the case. And I very much appreciate it. That did not prove to be the case. No, always. no, unfortunately. The podcast has not reached that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're still... Um, uh, what I'll often tell people when, when that sort of timing stuff comes up is that when I first came up with this idea, I thought I'd be done in a year and I thought it would be 10 episodes long and I similarly had fears that I would be uh, done too quickly before something happened. But um, as, as, as you know, as I know, as probably most of the listeners <laughs> know as well, that... Um, that fear is not very well founded, but um, no, thank you very much um, for, for your kind words there, Matt. And, and thank you for reaching out as well, because I agree, it is, it is a unique and important text. Um, and, and you know what, Let, let's just get into some of that. Um, so like we said, it's, it's written from this unique perspective. It's written from this unique time. And I mean, anyone with even vague sort of associations with how how historians do their work is that you treat a source 
uh, like that. Like, who wrote it? When was it written? What was the reason it was written for? And and Prisoners of Class is very unique in, in those aspects. But as you said, that it's the style that really stuck out to me in, in my first couple of read-throughs. And I wanted to just sort of talk a little bit about that first. And, and perhaps perhaps before we do that, it would be, obviously without giving the, the text away, did you want to just very briefly give us a, a kind of rundown of, of sort of the scope of the book? Would that be okay? Sure, yeah. So the, the book starts out, um, chap, chapter one is called 17 April 1975. It starts out on that day that the Khmer Rouge took Phnom Penh. Um, and it then covers the following you know, almost four years, 1,366 days to be precise, as he, he titled the first part of the first edition. Um, and ends just a few days after... Um, January 7th, 1979, when the Vietnamese captured Phnom Penh. The Vietnamese army did not make it to where he was until probably, I don't know, four or five days after that. So, and it covers the the historical events that it covers, even though it's a personal chronicle of his own daily life and the life of his family, you also see, sort of through his eyes, some of the, the bigger s- sketches of um, that period, including the first, that first migration, the, there, there were two great migrations that happened in 1975. First one was when everyone was expelled from Phnom Penh and other major towns on foot, unexpectedly, and everyone was on the move, having to find a place to settle and not knowing what was going to happen or when they could return. Um, that is that is described in tremendous um, detail. Uh, and then there's the famine also that occurs in, ni- in 1975 when suddenly this the country, the, the agricultural capacity had been destroyed by war. Half of the country was like living in the in, as refugees in the capital and being fed by Amer- American airlift on a daily basis. The Air- Americans were literally flying r- tons of rice in every day just to feed these people. Suddenly the Americans were gone and suddenly all these people were on the move and the agricultural capacity was destroyed and there was just not enough food for everybody. And so there was a lot of starvation and famine that happened in that first year and that is covered in great detail. Um, and then there's the second migration in which the Khmer Rouge they had all these city people had migrated to the provinces surrounding Phnom Penh, and now the Khmer Rouge started to have designs to how can we use these people in in other labor projects elsewhere in the country, and started moving people around by train, by truck, largely up to the northwest of the country, which is sort of traditionally the sort of the rice bowl, quote unquote, of Cambodia, where they had some big projects in mind, um, irrigation projects, um, rice farming projects, etc., for what they called the Great Leap Forward or the super great leap forward, sometimes it's called. Um, And his family was part of that. So his family was part of that second migration. They were moved up to the Northwest to participate in these projects. Um, Then there's just lots of chapters covering what he does during those years. He he works on all kinds of mobile labor units and um, farming rice and collecting fertilizer, making fertilizer. Um, What else? did he do well he digging yeah lots of yeah. digging yeah <laughs> exactly yeah these these massive digging canals, canals and the reservoir yeah, exactly yeah uh, p- part of this was the construction of what's called the the Trepeng Tama reservoir which was the largest Khmer Rouge uh, like public works project irrigation project of democratic Kampuchea a massive massive reservoir holding millions of liters of water dug by 40,000 people by hand with hose and baskets um, he was a part of that and he describes it in tremendous detail. Uh, Craig Etchison told me that he did a lot of research on that that event, and he interviewed a lot of people in that area. And he said, he told me, I learned stuff about those events from reading this book. Tremendous detail um, in the book. Anyway, so other other events in, in of that period that are covered in, in, in mid-1977-ish, there was a, a purge of all of the Khmer Rouge cadre in the northwestern zone where he lived. And he talks about that. They're all replaced by cadre from the Southwest Zone. Then in 1978, there were there were more purges of not just cadre but just regular people. There was a lot of there's sort of like a witch hunt to to root out the CIA, the KGB, and the Vietnamese. Um, and that's covered in the book. And then of course the end of the Khmer Rouge when they are scattered is also covered at the end of the book. So that's sort of a sketch of the, the historical events that are covered here. And then you just get the daily life of a person living through that sort of in between. Yeah, I think that's one of the most fascinating parts about the 
book, uh, reading it as someone who who has a you know a vague understanding of the the timeline of events, but you're reading it from the perspective of someone who quite obviously doesn't have that perspective, and yet the two line up very very well. Um, so it's that's what I'm talking about. These kinds of uh, uh, aspects of it as a historical source, not just as a as a memoir, um, I found fascinating. But um, I want to just hammer down a little bit on on sort of the writing style. It it is uh, it's quite poetic. It, uh, at, in times, it it I mean it does literally include some poems and and songs, but but the writing style itself as well is it's. I, 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 I'm not a literary uh, critic or anything like that, so I don't feel like I quite have the words to describe it sometimes, but um, I was wondering if you had any insight into sort of the intent behind that aspect of it on, on behalf of, of the author. Um, did, was this... Presumably he had no sort of training as as a writer. This this just came naturally to him, or, or is it, are there cultural sort of um is there a context there that led him to write it in this style do you have any insights into that um i actually don't know for sure i've never like asked him this question particularly um but he does have this tendency to what what i would say wax lyrical he's often gets very lyrical in the way he describes things he'll he'll describe even a scene and he'll paint a picture with words to describe the scene um or whatever and he, he doesn't have any background in like you know, literature studies or anything like that. Um, I do know quite a bit about his youth and education because he actually wrote a book about it recently that I have read and it, it is unpublished. Maybe I will, oh, I plan on translating and publishing that in the, within the next couple of years. But uh, he he um, he grew up poor in Phnom Penh, a poor family, but he, he did end up getting a, a place in um, some public, some good quality public schools in Phnom Penh. He attended what was called the Model High School, which is a high school on the grounds of the College of Pedagogy in Phnom Penh. So it was actually a good high school where they trained teachers. And he got in there somehow on scholarship or something. Um, and he was actually a very good student. He was towards the top of his class. And, and I know that he studied things like French literature and Khmer literature. I think he took a little bit of English, you know, along with all the other subjects that high school students learned in those days. Um, but that was the extent of it. He, he didn't ever like go to college to get a degree in whatever literature or poetry or anything like that. In fact, he's a civil engineer. Um, but it, it, having known him, he, he does come across to me as almost like a sort of a Renaissance man. He, ha- he has an artistic flair. He has a poetic flair to him. And he, um, you know, he's in touch with his emotions. And I think he's, it's just a natural gift that he has. I think he just has a gift for expression and writing. And I've read a number of Khmer book, books in Khmer and, to me, he's by far the clearest. He's a very clear writer and a very expressive writer. I think it's just ne- his nature. It's just who he is. Wow. Yeah, it, and uh, so, sort of one of the reasons I was going down that path was because he has a way of describing some things that are, again, for people that are familiar with the subject, these terms are sort of part and parcel with, uh, let's say, the language of the regime. So mm-hmm. the the difference between the new people or the April 17 people and the base people and, um, you know, there's a an example uh, people might be familiar with in the film The Killing Fields where uh, Dithpran talks about uh, the, this new disease, the, the consciousness sickness kind of thing. Yes. And, and a lot of these are, as I said, sort of part and parcel for these memoirs, but... In Prisoners of Class, he, he has these different sort of, almost like his own phrases for these words that I found, as you say, it, lyrical, poetic, but also kind of echoed by uh, the, the wider historiography or, and scholarly works on it. Um, one, one stood out to me in particular that instead of uh, constantly referring, self-referring as new people or, or April 17 people as the class he was designated within, he uses this phrase, life slaves, yes. throughout. And and in, in, in ways it's more appropriate um, and, and when these people will unceremoniously disappear um, in the night on multiple occasions throughout the work, he, he will talk about the 
the, the role of the life slave in this way that maybe conveys a bit more than what the Khmer Rouge term uh, does for that kind of person. And it was something that um, I, I'm sure it may have been written beforehand, but it's it's a phrase that sticks out in uh, Philip Short's book, uh, Philip Short's biography of, of Pol Pot, where he says that, I'm paraphrasing, but that democratic Kampuchea was in essence, the first modern day slave state. And and sometimes that gets uh, people's minds working toward what this regime was more than perhaps phrases like like it was year zero or they were trying to turn back time. It, was, it yeah. wasn't really that as much as it was a labour camp, uh, a nationwide prison with no walls, to, to use another phrase that was um, used by a lot of survivors. That sort of goes to this his his experience of these events without the benefit of of hindsight like like he's writing this text as you said very very close after like this is before many westerners even knew what had happened like uh, barely um, any historians had had begun working on on the inner workings of of this regime but he he has a way of speaking to events that that can very clearly convey what was going on. You mentioned um, internal purges. There's one uh, sort of scene that really stuck out to me um, when there is a... So would you... Uh, I'm going to talk about Comrade Tit, okay. uh, who was presumably like a village... Uh, I want to say village chief or the sort of the head com- cadre in, in the village that he was stationed at. Um he comes under suspicion, um, and there's this scene where uh, Chan Samuan is is basically sat with this hiding senior cadre, or perhaps senior is not exactly the right word, but but someone that that had authority who is sort of smoking a cigarette, who who knows that he's going to very soon be taken away to die, and he sort of confines in him and says like i i did what i could for the revolution and and now they're going to kill me and when i was reading this i i realized just how much that must have been a prevailing opinion uh amongst many of these cadre that did decide to sort of defect or um, in other ways, sort of subvert the regime because this was a reality uh, for for these people as well for the for the believers in the revolution that they too um, would be rather unceremoniously taken away in the night or perhaps worse sent to um, an interrogation center and obviously the central node of that perhaps being one of the worst places that they could have been sent to when in s twenty one so these are the things that kind of stick out to me as as someone interested in the wider historical um, details. So I'm wondering if there's any any anything like that. Like you've you've been much closer to this text. Is there any other examples like that that really stick out to you? I, I'm not sure there are other examples, but the, the the most salient thing for me, you mentioned the phrase. This is his phrase: "life slaves." Um, which parallels the Khmer Rouge term, new people, which they use. And he uses that a lot too. I, I would say this is the central theme of the book that he, he comes back to again and again and again. And it's reflected in the title of the book itself, actually. Um, for, for those of your listeners who may not know, the, the, um, the Khmer Rouge, once they took power, they divided society into like two categories, essentially. They were called the new people and the base people. Um, new meaning new people referred to those people who were in the cities up to the end. They were not part of the, they're not in Khmer Rouge territory, what's called liberated zones until the very end. And these, they were treated differently. They were categorized differently and they were called new people. The other people were called base people, base meaning, you know, a foundation. The, the, the Khmer word Mulatan means a, a literally a foundation on which something else is built. These people were the beneficiaries of the revolution. They were the base basis of the revolution. The new people were sort of um, considered to be tainted, irrevocably tainted by the past, by the Lanol regime, um, by capitalism and by wealth. And as far as I can tell, the Khmer Rouge just sort of writ them off, wrote them off. The Khmer Rouge wrote them off um, as um, un- unsalvageable, essentially. But so first they were going to sal- they were going to exploit them for their labor for as long as they could. 
but they gave them less food, they gave them less medical attention, and they and they executed them on a whim for saying or doing the wrong thing. Um, and to me, so he he calls them life slaves, and he calls the he called the base people and, and the cadres he called them life masters. So he had he has he has these two categories, and so he's constantly talking about society now has two classes, two divisions. One of them are slaves, and the and the others are masters. And um, me and my family, we are in, in, among the slaves. And um, t- to me, like I, I, for most of my life, I've struggled to understand like the Khmer Rouge, why they did what they did. And this is part of why I like your podcast because this is the question that I feel like the podcast is trying to answer. Um, and because when you read about like the Khmer Rouge leaders, when you read about their early years, when they're students, young people in like college in Paris and they're becoming these Marxists and they, they're getting these ideas. They're not starting out saying, Hey guys, let's destroy our country. Let's, um, let's murder everybody. They have these ambitious ideals. Like I think real ideals to make the country a better place. And then you fast forward, um, 30 years and suddenly people are dying in, in droves. And I've always tried to figure out what's the disconnect here. What's the disconnect between the, those ideals and what actually happened. And I think part of the answer is understanding this dynamic of new people. And how the, the at some point for whatever reason the Khmer Rouge came to to realize that the new people had to be sacrificed for the revolution, that they were not the beneficiaries of the revolution; they were a, a, a liability to the revolution. Um, so and, and and so for the, for the title of the book, that's why he changed the name of it. Actually, the the working title when he first wrote it originally back in 1979 was 1,366 Days in Hell. But after he published the first two parts, he thought to himself, "Well, this is not." This, I mean, it's describing, as he says, the duration of suffering, but it's not capturing the main essence of what happened. And so he took the, the title Prisoners of Class, which to him ca- encapsulates this, because you use the phrase prisoners with a uh, prison without walls. He uses that phrase multiple times in the book. He says this is a, the whole country is a giant prison with no walls. And I'm a prisoner. My family is a prisoner. Um, and all because of our class. We are classed as new people and therefore we are prisoners. Um and I, I, a word on, you mentioned also um, the consciousness sickness. Um, this, I can tell you actually, the, the translation of that phrase in the book was influenced by you, Lachlan Peters, because you actually had an, sort of a, an essay in an earlier episode where you talked about this phrase, consciousness sickness and its Buddhist origins and all kinds of things like that. At that time, my draft of the manuscript, I had translated the phrase as mentality sickness. And when I heard that, I realized, I think I've got the wrong word here. I need to fix this. And I changed it to consciousness sickness. Um, and, you know, in, in in the movie, The Killing Fields, I think that um, the character Dit Prawn calls it memory sickness. But basically what this is, is just, um, I feel like the word mentality works because it sort of maps onto what it means in English. The way they use it in English, the consciousness sickness was that if you're unhappy, if you're, if you, if you're sick, if you're struggling, um, to work to perform your revolutionary duty, it's because you have this sickness. It's this this sickness. It's the sickness of your mind, your mentality. You don't have the right mind for it set. Um, you don't have a revolutionary mindset. It's because you're remembering the past too much. You're thinking about life before the revolution. You're thinking about bourgeois things. You're thinking about capitalist things, etc. Um, so, yeah. Wow, that's really cool to hear. It's um, I mean, it's kind of. I guess this mini mission within, I guess, the larger study I've been doing all these years of the whole, the whole thing, the whole regime, and it's, yeah, it's this question, why? And like you said, eventually that question will take you down to the very smallest levels. Eventually you just get to the human brain and that, and that decision-making process. And, and then when you look at that and um, I guess start working back up, you're confronted with these questions of how how was this ideology implanted in a way that that allowed so many people to to kill so many innocent people and and you have um i've in particular taken to the work of uh, the anthropologist um alex hinton on this subject well i mean at least for me he was the first person to point out this um this use of like buddhist grammar is i think the way he puts it um the way that the khmer rouge intentionally or or perhaps even unintentionally were utilizing this this Theravada Buddhist well, just like cultural milieu in Cambodia and, and were not only able to transplant certain ideas about 
you know, communism generally, but also in the ways in which people were able to, I guess, consider who was an enemy of the regime and, 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 and to the extent that they were able to, to, to necessarily kill that person. And um, I guess what I think, you know, just to echo what you were sort of saying earlier about our, the new people and this base people distinction, I found that this term revolutionary consciousness, I think in Khmer, I'll probably butcher the um, pronunciation, but Satyarama as this, you know, their conception of, of revolutionary consciousness is different from perhaps other socialist regimes use of that term, basically because of the culture it was being used in. And, and I feel like it was this very important distinction. It was perhaps the most important how what would you say sort of marker of whether someone might uh, survive the regime was um this i guess buddhist conception of mindfulness of action and intent but in relation to the the party line the party doctrine um and you know the base people were thought to have i guess be closer to being able to or, or i guess more ideal uh candidate to be able to develop that uh revolutionary consciousness where whereas the uh the new people as you said they were sort of tainted by by their past um their class uh sort of attributes and um anyway it's a bit of a rabbit hole there but it's it's really cool to hear that you've sort of made that that um adjustment i I didn't know that based on on the show yeah and you made me think of another so you made me think of another Buddhist influence that I had, that I had not thought of um, in, in the Khmer Rouge and that also appears in this book. Um, there, there's, this, there's, a, there's a saying that in the Pali language, the, the, the Buddhist clerical language, that says, Atahe Atanao Niatao, which is often cited by Cambodian Buddhists, and it means um, one must depend upon oneself. In other words, one, self-reliance. One must be self-reliant. And... The Khmer Rouge hammered on this a lot, and um, independence. I mean, this mastery. was part of the yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And this is the reason why, um, you know, I talked about the the famine of nineteen seventy five. The the international community, as I understood, stood ready to offer food aid to help the country get back on its feet and not starve to death after the end of the war. And the Khmer Rouge just steadfastly refused and said, "No, we do this ourselves. This is us. We don't need your help. We don't need anyone's help." Although, I mean, they got a lot of help from China, let's be honest, but they didn't want any help from the imperialists or the, or the capitalists. So, um, No, you're yeah. exactly right. That, and there's a lot of Echo's um, uh, influence or how it was used, perhaps is, is the better way of putting that, used to basically spread an ideology that will kill millions of people. Um, it's really fascinating stuff and listeners to the podcast will getting a bit more of that as as the podcast itself goes on but I was wondering if um I wanted to move on to kind of the basically more favorite parts of the book for me um and just before I did that I I did uh, this wasn't in the running order but I this morning when I was making some notes about it just to to sort of um perhaps wrap up one of the things you were mentioning there about his his sort of writing style as we sort of move away from from that topic i just want to read out so this is a quote from the book um when you mentioned the the leadership having these sort of lofty ideals and didn't set out to to basically destroy the cambodian people and yet that's what happened but um so this is a quote from the book directly the doctrine speaks of doing good purity and justice but the actual reality is that we are a people living in a pit of suffering, in a pool of blood, which I circled in the book and I put a note and I highlighted it. Just like this is uh, just one of many examples of of the the way that the author captures this period. And, and for me, it, it is just really compelling writing um, and just one of, like I said, one of many examples of that. Um, but another is one that I, I sort of wanted to flag with you and it's, uh, perhaps a little bit, I don't know, it's, I, I, as I was going through the notes, I, I realized, um, on my Kindle, I'd, I, the note for this paragraph I'd written, oh, what a coincidence, um, which is in the, the very early parts of when I was doing this 
planning for this whole podcast series. As I said, uh, it's going to be finished in a year and be 10 episodes, but not quite. But I had this, this thought occur to me at some point in those very early days of this country that was cut off from the world to a large extent, a very large extent, um, but that the world was going there were people, I, th I think one of the movies that came out in 1975 was um, Monty Python's The Holy Grail. It's one of, you know, like this this classic movie that's going, I'm sure there's lots of other examples that we could use there. But another thing that's going on is space travel. Where humanity has broken the void and is is landing on the moon, is is docking with other spaceships, uh, sending satellites into space. Meanwhile, there's this hermit country in Southeast Asia that is spending most of its time um, just watching its population die. And that, like, you can't get much more of a, like, literal sort of scale of, of human flush or fl flourishing there. You've got people in a space station... And you've got people in a pit um, too thirsty to do anything or too hungry to do anything and being killed if they were to complain about it. Um, and as I was reading the book, uh, the author himself, uh, so sort of midway through the book, um, he's staring up at the night sky and he sees a, a moving star, which he identifies as a satellite, or in, in his words, he says a spacecraft. And he says, please, spacecraft carry our pleas and tell the rest of humanity so they can come to our aid. Come and deliver us from the cruel, tormenting manacles of this hell on earth. Please don't forget us, all right? Please help us. And and again, another one of these parallels where, where the author is just is so brilliant at, 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 at sort of capturing some of these thoughts and like I said, that one really stood out to me because I'd had the same thought years earlier. But um, I'm wondering if there's any other examples like that that stand out for you. Sure. I guess we're talking about favorite parts of the book now. So that's this section of the book club. <laughs> uh, first of all, let me say how what, what a delight it is for me to hear you identify that scene as your favorite scene. Because when I was preparing for this interview... I, I, I didn't know if you were going to ask me to read any excerpts or whatever. And I thought, if I was to have to read an excerpt, what would I pick? And that was the excerpt that I picked. That, oh, that's really? my favorite part of the book. Amazing. Book. Like, I actually went in there and highlighted that section in preparation for this interview and, and reread it. Um, and I completely agree with you. There's something about the, the incongruity there of the life. It's like Cambodia had been sent back into the Dark Ages. The, the way they were living was like no technology, hard labor, um, difficult life. It was almost like they, there was no modern world and they were blocked off from the modern world. And then to suddenly just look up in the sky and see this spacecraft, as he called it, it could have been Skylab. There was there was an actual space station in the sky at that time. And and, and suddenly it's just like he, he just catches this glimpse of this outside modern world that is all, all, you could almost have forgotten even exists anymore. Um, and then just the, the, the poignancy of those pleas, pleading with this, almost like a prayer. It was like a prayer. He was praying to the spacecraft, begging for help. Yeah, I really loved that. Um, apart from that, if we're talking about favorite parts, um, I have a particular affection for the first chapter, chapter one, because this is the chapter that describes this event where the commanders captured Phnom Penh. And in my opinion, this is one of the, the most epic historical events of the 20th century, where an entire city of upwards of three million people was suddenly and instantly evacuated on foot without warning, without preparation, and without any exceptions. Um, nobody was expecting this to happen. And suddenly next thing you know, every, every single person in the city has to just leave on foot. Um, so it was quite a remarkable event and it was a remarkable day, 17th of April, 1975. And I've read a lot of accounts of it and his by far, I don't know how to say by far, but his is the most detailed account of that event that I think I've ever read. Um, and I have to say just as, as a person who likes history or, or history or consuming history, I love details. Um, especially if it's something that touches on me or my life or something I'm familiar with, like Phnom Penh, Cambodia, which is a place I'm intimately familiar with. Whenever I read a history that talks about events that happened in Phnom Penh, and, and they'll say such and such happened, but they won't tell me where it happened, I get frustrated. 
I'm like, just tell me where it was. I want to be able to visualize what you're talking about. And, and when they do, when they connect events to like details and actual like locations, to me, it makes history come alive. It makes it less abstract. It makes it grounded in the real world, the actual real world to me. And so sometimes even though like Pinyatai in his description of this day, he goes into actually quite a bit of detail, which I loved. But I, even I would get frustrated because I wanted to, to say, where, where did that happen? Just give me the address, give me the street or the intersection or whatever, wherever that happened. Um, but I didn't have this problem with, with Chan Sam Un, the way he, the, the way that he describes it, like, it's almost like he's a, a kindred spirit when it comes to details, because he gives them, he gives them all to me. I, I can almost take a, a pen and a map of Phnom Penh and trace his motions, his movements through the city from morning until evening on that day, street by street, uh, intersection for intersection, because he just gives you all the details of everything that he saw. Um, some people might think that's a little bit much. Maybe some people don't care that much for the, for those kinds of details, but I love it. Um, and also because some of the things that he described were places that were familiar to me, places that I knew well from my own youth coming of age on the streets of that city. And that just made it come to life to me. So yeah, I have a special affection for chapter one, chapter two also, um, probably I'd say probably chapter two continues that journey out of Phnom Penh on the following days. I totally agree. It, um, it gives, as you say, it's a monumental event, but you're often find it sometimes not quite given the the detail that yeah. is necessary like you 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 understand tacitly that all of these things must have happened and it must have taken a long time but it'll often just come across in a couple of sentences you know, say yeah. well yeah well the, the 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 inhabitants of the city were forced out into the countryside and it, sometimes it took days weeks sometimes months for people to get there and people go oh wow that's wow but when you're given this account yeah. of, as you say, the street by street, so, uh, as you say also, Pinyatai is a, gr a great account of it and he, he does express that um, sort of slowness of it all and, and things like that. But it is when you get these accounts that, that have that really granular detail that you can, as you say, you can trace it almost, almost day by yeah. day, this journey out of the city. And all of a sudden that sort of... Um, you know, those two sentences about, oh, everyone had to leave the city becomes an epic in itself. Um, and, and yeah, I totally agree. It's, I think for a lot of people, it's, it, it can be this instigating event that, that just tractor beams them into the rest of the story because it's a, a more or less a unique event and it's in, and the scale and the tragedy of it and the unexpected nature of it. I don't think it's, something that anyone can really um, truly try and fathom so yeah again these these accounts of it are, are not only fascinating but really quite valuable um and and just to pick up on something you said yeah uh, it is part of the reason i'm so fascinated is that you can today in phnom penh go to uh this corner of this street and you can know that that this event happened right here um mm -hmm. it was only earlier today again in sort of preparation for this as well that you can get on google maps you can go on street view and uh there's one photo that you've included in the book of a uh a football pitch a soccer oval yep. um where they camped out near a high school on on their way out of Phnom Penh and uh, I could see the angle from where you'd taken the photo and I could jump in on street view. I went, I sort of zoomed out on Phnom Penh. I went, Oh, there's Bong Chabai. Bong Chabai. I'll, there's a bit of a, there's a bit of a grass there. I wonder if that's it. Street view. Oh, yep. That's the oval. And then I could sort of virtually walk down to where that high school was and have a look around for myself. And that's what I love about, um, about this story and how vivid it is. And it sort of brings me to, to my next point, which is, I imagine a lot of these contributions you've you've, you've we've got um, quite detailed maps. We've got photographs included in this sort of edition. This 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 translation you've made this this contribution. I would say to to the work. Um, I understand that there's sort of a story to that. I was wondering if you wanted to um, sort of expand on that for me a bit. Sure. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier that. Um, in 2022, I, when I decided to finish this book, that I, that I had scheduled to meet the author in Phnom Penh and that I did meet him and confront him. 
Um, so when I got to uh, Phnom Penh, and I, I finally met him after all these years, uh, met him face to face, and here he is. He was 70, let me see, see, 70. I think he was 70 years old at the time. Um, his hair had turned gray, um, and he, he has this little office in his house. just just packed with books, lots and lots of books, books everywhere. Um, uh, he he's just has a fascination with books and reading lots of books about Cambodian history and all kinds of other things. Um, and we sat and we just talked. We talked like for hours and he told me um, about his youth, his childhood. We talked about the book. And, and I found right away, one of the things that I noticed about him right away is how close to the surface his emotions are. He he can't talk about these things without getting weepy. He Just talking about his childhood um, or his parents, he gets weepy and he has a hard time controlling his emotions. And that was very endearing to me. Um, and... Uh, and then so part of part of my reason for going to Cambodia at this time, besides meeting the author and making arrangements for permissions to translate and all those other things, was um, I wanted to go and visit the places where these things happened. I wanted to see them with my own eyes after having read about them so much. Um, part of that was, I mean, I wanted to get some photographs, hopefully for the book, and I wanted to get some uh, GPS readings because I wanted to build detailed maps. And maybe we can talk about that a little later if you want. Um, but uh, we... Um, and so I had this plan. I was going to go out to, there's, there's a district in northwestern Cambodia called Phnom Srok District. Modern day Bantia Minche province. It used to be Batambang province at the time. And that's where the majority of the events of this book take place is right there in Phnom Srok District. And I wanted to go th just up to Phnom Srok and spend several days and just collect GPS readings of all the villages and all the, all the landmarks and place names that he mentions by name in the book so I could build a map that was satisfactory to my needs and my interests. Um, and... When I, when I told this to the author on that first day of meeting him, he said, well, would you mind if I came along? Which I was not expecting and I was not planning for, but I was actually delighted um, at the idea that I could travel and visit these places that I had been reading about and translating about with the actual author himself. Um, and we did. So uh, once, once transportation had been arranged, we, we took a bus up to Siem Reap town um, and then spent the night at a guest house. And then the next day, we met up with his brother. So his younger brother, spoiler, his younger brother, one of his brothers survives. And he's still alive. Um, his name is Samon. In the book, it's S-A-M-O-R-N, like Samorn. But it's actually pronounced in Khmer, Samon. Um, anyway, so we met with Samon and another of his friends named Brat Jan Tuen, who is a member of the Siem Reap Provincial Council, an elected member of the Provincial Council. Um, who also spent the revolution in the same area at the same time. They didn't know each other, but they met, they met, they became friends later through the book. This man read the book, was very moved and touched by it and reached out to the author and became his friend. So it was me and these three older Cambodian men, all of whom had experienced this. Um, and we went to Phnom Srok. We, I had to condense everything down to one day instead of several days because, you know, you're traveling with old men and they want to get in and get out and get home to bed or whatever. But, but that's fine because so I, I planned everything out in advance all the places I wanted to see, and we just hit as much as we could in one day. And um, one of one of the most the most touching thing that happened to me on this excursion was the, one of the things at the top of my list of things that I wanted to find, if possible, was there's a place that he mentions in the book. He actually mentions it in the satellite section that we were talking about. He mentions this place called uh, Paui Trach. I struggle with how to Anglicize this. In, in Khmer, it's Paui Trach. But that's, it, it looks like P-A-O-Y space T-R-A-C-H, Paui Trach. Um, and th that was sort of the local Khmer Rouge, um, I guess you could say killing field. It was sort of the execution site of choice for the local Khmer Rouge cadre in that district. Um, that's where they take you. And it was, it was sort of a, it was, it was out in the middle of, of, of a big plain of rice fields, just flat rice fields. And, and, and every now and then in those rice fields, there's sort of a little, spot of high ground with trees on it like a little slightly elevated area um, where that doesn't flood in the rainy season and that's where they build the villages and the cemeteries and so forth but there was one called Pali Trash that didn't have any villages or anything on it and that was that was their execution site of choice and the author believed that um, his younger brother and his young and his and his sister were both executed there and um I was wondering if it was possible to even find. And so I told him that. I said, I'm wondering if we can find Pali Trash. And he had never been there. None of these three men had ever been there. They knew people who had seen it with their own eyes. 
there's even a description in the book of someone telling him what they had seen when they saw it. Um, but he had never been there. So we were having lunch at, at this little cafe slash metal shop slash house, which is a very typical Cambodian thing. All this, this little place in this local town. And there was this old man living there at the, and he was conversing with us. And one of my companions asked the old man, do you know where this is? Pali Trach? And, and he says, oh, sure. I know where that is. Do you know how to get there? He says, yeah. Can you drive there? Yes, there's a road that goes right to it. And this surprised them because they didn't imagine it would be that easy. Um, and he just gave us a description. He says, if you, you know, at the southwest corner of town, head west out across the plains of rice fields, two kilometers, there's a Bodhi tree. That's where Pali Trach used to be. Um, I can interject here and say a lot, a lot of these sort of, um, these spots of, like these high spots of high ground and trees um, that are, that feature as prominent sites in the book have largely been erased. They've just been erased and replaced with more rice fields more and more rice fields. Um, but he said this road goes right to this Bodhi tree, and the Bodhi tree is a significant symbol in Buddhism as, as, as the tree under which the Buddha attained enlightenment. Um, and we followed his instructions and drove out there and found the Bodhi tree, just like he said, right there on the side of the road. And, sorry, let me go back a little bit. When he said this, yes, you can drive right to it. Um, I looked over at the author, Chan Samu, who was sitting there quietly listening, and he was getting choked up. He was trying really hard not to cry, and he was trying to control his emotions. And he, ha he couldn't speak because he was so choked up. And when he finally got control over his emotions, um, he said, Today, I'm going to see the place where my brother and my sister died. And he turned to his um, brother, who, ha who had stepped away for a moment and was just had just returned, and said, Some on, go buy some incense. We're going to go see the place where uh, some at and on died. And he, so his brother went and got the incense and we got in the car and drove out there and found the spot. And I watched as he and his brother got out the incense and they, you know, they lit several of them. They stuck several of them in the ground at the base of the Bodhi tree. They held some in their palms and they prayed. And he essentially um, just sort of spoke out loud to his siblings, almost like a, like a prayer, I guess, uh, just wishing them peace, wishing them happiness in the next life. Um, and that, to me, that was a remarkable thing to have witnessed and to have been a part of. Um, and and at, at the time, I was also sort of just looking around wondering, like, are there mass graves here? Was there a mass grave here? I didn't see any signs of anything like that. Um, later, I did some research with the Cambodian Documentation Center to find out what I could learn about that site. And um, they said, they gave me what they call a mapping report, where the, 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 the Cambodian Documentation Center would go out to all these sites and collect evidence and data and make these reports. And so they gave me a mapping report from that site from the 90s. And um, uh, it said, the mapping report said that there was no mass grave at that site. That at that particular site, they would just kill people and leave them on the ground in the trees. They just leave piles of corpses in the trees, um, anywhere between hundreds to thousands of people. And that eventually those bones and remains were collected and, and placed in um, the local pagoda in Phnom Srok town. Um, so, yeah, and on, and on that trip, I also saw the, the reservoir that they dug, which is still there. It's, it's, a, it's still in use for agricultural purposes. It's a, it was a very successful project, um, and it stores lots of water, has lots of canals, and irrigates lots of rice fields to this day. And it was it was shockingly vast in person. You stand up on the on the road that's on, along the dam and just look out across the water, and it's huge. It's so big, it's like you can almost hardly see the other side. The little teddy trees on the other side of the reservoir. Oh, it's funny you should mention the reservoir because it's it's another part that stood out to me in the book is that it it's maybe one of the it is a moment where he looks at what this effort has actually produced uh, um, to, as you said 40,000 people at probably many thousands um, died of overwork disease and and executions constructing this as well and and as we mentioned the sort of painstaking like a, when you read this as well there's a sort of hypnosis that you fall into in the writing of the painstaking back-breaking thirsty hungry labor but at the end he has this moment of pride at at this at this accomplishment and and to to see it still in use today I, it's it's a it's sort of another fascinating 
thing to draw on there. Did, did he have anything to say about that in a sort of modern context as well? Yeah, so he, he, he actually does, he mentions both in the book that he was proud when he, when he looks at the reservoir, that he was proud of the of his, uh, almost like a national pride, like this is a national accomplishment that we achieved and I was part of it. Um, but I, I specifically asked him about this. And if you'll give me a minute, I'm going to look this up. I wrote his response in the afterword. So here, I'll, I'll read this chapter here. This is from the afterword. In the afterword of the book, I described some of these things that I'm telling right now about, about our journey together. I said, I, la- I later asked Samuel what he feels when he looks at the Bang Tamar Reservoir now, if he still feels the pride of accomplishment that he mentioned briefly in his book, and if so, whether it outweighs the bitterness. He told me that despite the terrible price of suffering paid, he does feel a sort of pride of national accomplishment when he looks at the results of all that work in which he played a part. The feelings of bitterness have faded, he said, because, quote, as long as you insist on dwelling on suffering, you can't build a new life. You can't build happiness, close quote. That's, uh, that's really sort of profound advice to us, uh, readers today as well, with our um, sort of our own life problems, to be able to reflect on something that deep. But um, Matt, before we sort of close out here, um, before you mentioned uh, the process it took to sort of create some of these maps as well, I was wondering if you wanted to, to expand on that a little bit as well. Sure. Um, I am what I would say a map guy. I like maps. I, and it, this dovetails with my what I said earlier about being liking details, I think. Um, but the descriptions in the book of especially Phnom Srok district, there, there are so many geographic details that he drops left and right. Um, and the relationship of one place to another and traveling from one place to another and so forth. That when I was reading it and also, you know, translating it, I, I, I was desperate for a map. I wanted to find a map that could sort of reveal to me the, the actual relationship between these places that he's talking about. And I did find a couple of maps, but they didn't have a ton of detail. They had some, which was helpful, um, but not a lot. And so I just decided, you know, I really want to make my own map for this book. And, and part of that was collecting data myself in person, going to Phnom Stroke District and just um, figuring out where all these things were. And then, and I did. So I ended up making a very detailed map of Phnom Stroke District that is included in the book. If you buy the uh, the sort of international um, edition that you get off of Amazon or Barnes and Noble or Apple Books or whatever, uh, it's black and white, unfortunately. But the original map is color, that and that's the limitations of publication. What Amazon is willing to publish and so forth. Um, or, or if you get, oh, by the way, if you get the Kindle book, I think it's color in the Kindle book. Um, but anyway, so in addition to that Phnom Srok map, I also couldn't help myself and had to make maps for all the other things as well. So there's a detailed map of Phnom Penh, and there's one of um, Gien Swai District, and there's one of Sreisnam District and Siem Reap, which, have, which is in the end of the book, and um, the area around Phnom Penh. So pretty much every, any sort of geographical location that is covered in the book is covered in one or more maps um, in the back of the book, made by me. And like it's it's such a good contribution to it as well. I really um, I appreciate those details so much. Uh, maybe as someone sort of like minded, but um, it's always and and I think for people that travel to Cambodia or or are living there, just to know that you can still the, the, this this isn't this isn't some fantastical far away land. This this place exists. These places still exist, and and they're real. And, and I think going through that extra effort to, to sort of bring those elements into the book, I think, makes it stand out even within this um, sort of body of literature um, of, these, of these survival memoirs. But um, Matt, um, it's been so fascinating talking to you about this. It's, it's so good to have an insight this close into such, a, such an important book. Um, first of all, where can people get it? Because I, I really want to impress upon the listeners that um, this is a really great book on the subject and one that anyone with an interest in it um, should be going out to get. So so how can they do that, Matt? Um, if you go to MekongRiverPress.com, that is the publisher's website, there is a page for Prisoners of Class. There's lots of resources there for prisoners class. There's there's a lot of color photographs, more than are in the book. There's a lot larger set of color photographs on the website than there are in the book. All of the maps, 
a lot of sample chapters if you'd like to read sample chapters. And there are links to purchase the book on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, um, Apple Books, etc. For listeners who are in Cambodia, the, these outlets are not available. They don't, they don't distribute to Cambodia. A Amazon does not distribute to Cambodia. However, there is work in progress, imminent work in progress, to publish and print this book in Cambodia, and it will be distributed by Monument Books. Um, they have their main bookstore on Nordon Boulevard. They also have book kiosks in the, in the airports. They don't, they're not branded with Monument. They're named something else. I can't remember the name, but they are run and operated by Monument Books as well. I know there is one in the International Departures Terminal of the Phnom Penh Airport. Prisoners of Class will be available there in those kiosks, I believe, soon-ish, possibly by the time this, this podcast airs, um, as well as Siem Reap International Airport and any other Monument Books outlet that exists that I've forgotten about. Wow, that's such great news. Um, and if anyone who doesn't know about monument books in cambodia and is in cambodia it's it's a really great bookstore so i wholeheartedly recommend making a trip there it's all right well matt thank you so much again for coming on thank you so much again for for bringing this book to this wider audience it's um it's really fantastic work i'm so i mean i'm so happy for you that you've had this 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 dream of yours and you've been able to um sort of get there in in such a great way so congratulations on that and uh yeah is there did you want to give any contact details or anything like that if you want to be in contact with me for any reason um if you reach out if you go to the the website i mentioned before mekongriverpress.com there will be a contact email for the press which is i think contact at mekongriverpress.com if you reach out to that say you're looking for matthew madden and maybe say why you will almost certainly be put in contact with me probably forwarded to me. Um, yeah. And, and I'd like to say it was a real pleasure to be here on the podcast. I'm really glad to be here. I've been looking forward to this um, for a long time. I love the podcast and I'm happy to be a part of it. Thank you so much, mate. And uh, yeah, we'll be in touch soon, but um, everyone go out and get this book and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.